Hi everyone, Dr. Kofi here again and welcome to my YouTube channel, Tutor Med, where everything medicine is simplified. So far we have simplified the interpretation of the full blood count, the liver function tests, hepatitis B serology, urinalysis, CSF analysis, and the ECG. In today's video, we want to simplify the interpretation of the thyroid function test. And as you know, we will simplify this concept completely. And if you find this useful, kindly give us a like and share this video. In order to get updated on our simplified videos, kindly hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. Now, the links to the already discussed investigations have been provided in the video description below. And so feel free to look at them if you haven't seen them yet. Alright friends, grab your notepads and let's begin. And so as usual, let's begin with the first principles. The thyroid gland is an endocrine gland situated immediately below the larynx and expands the trachea anterolaterally. Let's use this diagram to illustrate this and so we are going to get our orientation using this diagram and so this is the diagram of the neck which shows the neck structures and so this structure here is called the thyroid cartilage and in fact the thyroid cartilage is part of the larynx and the structure here is known as the trachea and this is a thyroid gland and so what we are saying is that the thyroid gland is situated immediately below the larynx and so you can see the thyroid gland immediately below the the thyroid cartilage which is part of the larynx and you can see that it is also plastered onto the trachea you can see the lobe spanning from the lateral side of the trachea and then there's also a lobe located anterior to the trachea and so that is the thyroid gland and so in our previous slide we had a look at how the thyroid gland grossly looks like in the neck now let's take a section through the thyroid gland to see what is contained in them and so this diagram will help us and so as usual this is the thyroid gland and the picture on the right shows us a cross section of the thyroid gland so it tells us what is situated or what are the contents of the thyroid gland so you can see these circular um, structures these circular structures are known as thyroid follicles and so i'm going to label them as f so you have one thyroid follicle here then another thyroid follicle a thyroid follicle another thyroid follicle and then another thyroid follicle so you see that these follicles are separated by these yellowish strands in between them called the stroma and then they contain the blood vessels and so what i basically want to say here is that the thyroid gland is made up of a group of follicles separated by the stroma within the thyroid gland and so thyroid follicles and so on this slide let's take some time to understand the thyroid follicle and so i'm going to illustrate how the thyroid follicle looks like and so it is normally a spherical shaped structure so i'm going to illustrate it with this drawing here and then at the periphery of this spherical shape are the follicular cells and so we have one follicular cell followed by the next so i'm going to illustrate the follicular cells at the periphery very good 
and so the cells are arranged like this in the periphery and then at the center of the follicle is the lumen and this lumen contains a structure called or a substance called a thyroglobulin which is synthesized by the follicular cells and deposited into the center of the lumen. The thyroglobulin is synthesized from the amino acid or the amino acid tyrosine and it plays a very important role in the synthesis of thyroxine or the thyroid hormone I should have said. And so when we take in iodine through a series of reactions the iodine is transported into the follicle by the follicular cells and then it is added to the thyroglobulin and then through a series of reactions we will look at into details when we are discussing endocrine physiology through those series of reactions the thyroid hormones are produced now there are two types of thyroid hormones produced we have the thyroxine which is abbreviated or designated as T4 and then we have tyronine which is abbreviated or designated as T3. Now in truth during synthesis the thyroxine is synthesized more in more amounts compared to the tyronine T3 but the thyroxine when it gets into the peripheral tissues that is T4, when it gets to the peripheral tissues can be converted into T3. And I should mention that between the two, between T4 and then T3, T3 is about four times more potent than T4. And so please take note of that. So the, the objective of this slide is to tell you how the follicular cells or the follicle looks like and the fact that iodine is transported into the follicle and then through a series of reactions with the thyroglobulin we produce the thyroid hormones and so we are going to study how to interpret the thyroid function test very good and so now we are aware that the thyroid gland is responsible for producing the thyroid hormones but let's look at the other players which are involved in the regulation and then the secretion of thyroid hormones and so this is a picture showing the brain a section of the brain now this part is called the hypothalamus initially there was a misconception that the anterior pituitary was the master gland but that misconception has been corrected now we know the hypothalamus to be the master endocrine gland and so let's bring the thyroid gland here again so showing this picture here is a thyroid gland and so the hypothalamus the anterior pituitary and then the thyroid gland are the three players involved in the um, production and secretion of the thyroid hormones and so the hormone that is produced by the hypothalamus is called the thyrotropin releasing hormone abbreviated as trh then the thyrotropin releasing hormone will go to the anterior pituitary gland and stimulate the anterior pituitary gland to produce the thyroid stimulating hormone abbreviated as tsh and so it is this thyroid stimulating hormone which would go to the thyroid gland and stimulate it to produce and release the thyroid hormones we spoke about in our previous slide and it is worth mentioning that each of the steps involved in the synthesis of the thyroid hormone is somewhat mediated by the thyroid stimulating hormone from the anterior pituitary gland the tsh and so the trh will stimulate the anterior pituitary hormone sorry anterior pituitary gland which will produce the tsh and the tsh will stimulate the thyroid gland which will produce the thyroid hormone now when the thyroid hormone gets into circulation so we have the thyroxine which is t4 and the thyronine which is t3 when it gets into circulation because it is not a water soluble substance it is bound or it is free 
So when it gets to circulation, we have the free hormones and the bound hormones. So some of the hormones get bound to proteins and some of them are free. And so thyroid hormones in circulation can either be free or be bound. And so the protein that the thyroid hormones bind to is known as the thyroxine binding globulin, the TBG. Now, I want to point out that it is the free thyroid hormones which are metabolically active. The bound hormones are not metabolically active. And so the point here in summary is that before the thyroid glands can be stimulated to produce thyroid hormones, the hypothalamus has to release TRH which subsequently tells the anterior pituitary to release TSH and the TSH tells the thyroid gland to release the thyroid hormones. And when the hormones get into circulation, some of them are, are bound to plasma proteins called the thyroxine binding globulin and a small fraction of them remain free, are not bound. And it is these free components which are metabolically active. Now let's take a look at our last basic principle or first principles before we zoom into the interpretation of the test. And so there is a concept that is probably known to you called the negative feedback mechanism. Now this mechanism simply means that if you are producing a lot of a particular substance, say substance B, and then substance B gets so high in circulation, substance B will give you a feedback to stop producing it so that it can come down. That is basically it. And so the amount of free forms of thyroid hormones in circulation should be kept within normal ranges. The amount of the T43 should be kept within normal ranges. And so if there is an increased level of free thyroid hormones. Remember we said that it is a free thyroid hormones which are metabolically active. Those which are bound to the TBGs are not active. And so if you have a patient who has a high or an increased level of the free thyroid hormones, what do you think happens? Based on the explanation we gave, then those free thyroid hormones which are increased will go and tell those producing it to limit their production and so the high free thyroid hormones will go and tell mr hypothalamus to stop producing too much trh then because trh has gone down the anterior pituitary would also stop producing the tsh and even the high levels of the free thyroid hormones would even alert the anterior pituitary to stop producing the TSH as well. And so if TRH and TSH are down, then the thyroid would also be told to stop producing more thyroid hormones because the TSH is down. And this will ultimately normalize serum thyroid levels to from high to normal. And so an increased free thyroid hormones would cause a negative feedback on the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary so you have a low trh and a low tsh which will ultimately result in the thyroid minimizing their production of the thyroid hormones and this will normalize the serum thyroid hormones and so we've seen the situation where you have increased levels of thyroid hormones and then how the feedback mechanism works. Now let's look at a situation where you have a decreased level of thyroid hormones. What is going to happen? And so because there is a decreased level below normal, then the decreased level will tell Mr. Hypothalamus to produce more TRH. And the more TRH would uh, stimulate the anterior pituitary to produce more TSH. And then the more TSH will tell the thyroid gland to produce thyroid hormones and ultimately this will lead to the rise of the thyroid hormones which are down and to normalize the serum thyroid hormones. 
And so on this slide, let's look at the parameters we see on the thyroid function test report. Now one would expect that we should see the hormone from the hypothalamus which is TRH, the hormone from the anterior pituitary which is TSH and then the hormone from the thyroid glands which is free T3 and then free T4. However, there are only three parameters on the thyroid function test. One is the thyroid stimulating hormone, also known as the TSH. And then we have the free thyroxine, which is the FT4. And then we have free thyronine, that is FT3. And so on the thyroid function test, TRH is not present. And so these are the three parameters that are assessed or that are reported on the thyroid function test. The TSH, the free T4, and then the free T3. Now, which patients should be screened? In other words, which patients should have thyroid function tests done? When we have a patient presenting with signs of thyroid disease, it could be hypothyroidism, signs like weight gain, with anterior neck swelling, then cold hands, patient has dry thin hair or skin, these are some signs of hypothyroidism and then should warrant an investigation. These patients can even have a diastolic hypertension. Then we have a patient with signs of hyperthyroidism. And so a patient with protruding eyes, a patient with tremors, a patient with heat intolerance, diarrhea, unexplained weight loss despite good appetite, all these patients should have thyroid function test done. Then we have patients with hyperlipidemia should also have their thyroid function test done. The reason being that about 14 or about 4 to 14 percent of patients with hyperlipidemia may have hypothyroidism. Then a patient with atrial fibrillation should also have or get a thyroid function done because thyroid toxicosis or hyperthyroidism can cause atrial fibrillation. Then if you have a patient on amiodarone or lithium, every six months, literature says that his thyroid function test should be checked. Then we have a patient with Down syndrome, Turner syndrome, or Addison's disease. We should do yearly thyroid function tests for these patients because there is a risk of thyroid dysfunction. Then a patient with diabetes would have to get a thyroid function test done yearly, among other patients. And so by Analyzing the thyroid function tests, we can get abnormalities such as clinical hypothyroidism. The thyroid function test can help us diagnose that. Then we have clinical hyperthyroidism. And so we will take our time in the next few slides to see how to get these conditions on the thyroid function test. Again, the thyroid function test can help us get subclinical hypothyroidism. And then we have subclinical hyperthyroidism and then a TSH secreting tumor and then a central hypothyroidism. There are other abnormalities the thyroid function test can show but I want to discuss these six since these six are most commonly tested in exam. And so ready? Let's look at how the thyroid function test would look like in the various clinical problems I listed. And so, for clinical hypothyroidism, what do you think would happen to the free thyroid hormones? Remember that these patients will show clinical signs of hypothyroidism because the free thyroid hormones in circulation 
are reduced and that is what will cause the hypothyroidism clinically and so they would have a decreased free thyroid hormone so you see that the free t3 t4 are reduced then what do you think the tsh would be of course because of the feedback mechanism it would be increased so you have an increased tsh normally if the patient were not sick once the decreased free t3 and t4 um, i mean occurs the increased tsh should rather tell the thyroid gland to be producing a lot of the um the thyroid hormones to replace or to boost up the decreased free thyroid hormones but well, because the thyroid gland is sick then the patient would have a clinical hypothyroidism and so you have a decreased free t3 t4 and an increased tsh so let's look at clinical hyperthyroidism of course once you say hyperthyroidism it means that the free thyroid hormones are increased and so we have an increased free thyroid hormones once it is increased what do you think will happen to the tsh the feedback would go and tell the tsh to come down and so in clinical hyperthyroidism you would have an increased free thyroid hormones and then a decreased tsh pretty simple and so the next clinical entity we want to look at is subclinical hypothyroidism this means the patient has hypothyroidism but he is not showing clinical signs of the hypothyroidism if the patient is not showing clinical signs it means that the free thyroid levels are normal that is why he's not showing clinical signs and so it means that you are going to have normal levels of free thyroid hormones but what makes the patient hypothyroid is that the patient has an increased levels of tsh and so this is how i want to think about subclinical hypothyroidism i think about it this way that in subclinical hypothyroidism the picture is clinical hypothyroidism with normal normal free thyroid hormones because they are not showing symptoms and so that is why the tsh will be increased this is the same picture for someone who has clinical hypothyroidism but has been treated with thyroid replacement drugs and so this is the same so please take note then we move to subclinical hyperthyroidism again the term subclinical means that they are not symptomatic because they have the normal levels of free thyroid hormones and so you have a normal level of free thyroid hormones but because it is hyperthyroidism what do you think the tsh levels will be reduced and so again i like to think about subclinical hyperthyroidism as a patient with clinical hyperthyroidism or the picture of clinical hyperthyroidism by this time the free thyroid hormones are normal and so please note that this will be the same picture for a patient who has or who had clinical hyperthyroidism and has been put on some anti-thyroid drugs and so the levels of the free thyroid has come normal okay so we have a treated or someone who has been treated partially i hope this makes sense the fifth clinical entity we want to discuss its thyroid function test picture is a tsh secreting tumor now once you have a tsh secreting tumor it means that you are going to have increased levels of free thyroid hormones because remember the tsh is the stimulator or the stimulant of thyroid hormone production and so you are going to have an increased free thyroid hormones now this increased free thyroid hormones per the normal negative feedback mechanism is supposed to send a feedback to the anterior pituitary to stop producing the tsh however the anterior pituitary's tsh this time is not because of a normal mechanism it's because there is a tumor in there and so even if the free thyroid hormones increase it is not going to stop the tsh production because what is producing the tsh is a tumor and so you are going to have an increased levels of 
TSH. And so if you have increased levels of free thyroid hormones and then increased levels of TSH, you should be thinking about a TSH secreting tumor probably in there or in the anterior pituitary. Then the last clinical entity I want to talk about is central hypothyroidism. And so once there is hypothyroidism, what this means is that, I mean, let me start like this. Once there is central hypothyroidism, it means that there's a problem with the master gland, the hypothalamus. So the hypothalamus is not producing a lot of TRH. And so because of that, the reduced TRH is also not producing a lot of TSH. And then that would also result in decreased levels of free thyroid hormones. So in central hypothyroidism, you have a decreased level of the free thyroid hormones. And then as well, you'd have a decreased levels of the TSH. Why? Because the problem is from the master gland, the hypothalamus. And so people, on this slide, let's summarize everything we've said, all the clinical conditions. And so I'm going to draw a vertical line here. And I'm going to put the parameters of the thyroid function test in this row. So we have the free T3 or free T4. Then here we have the TSH. And so we will begin with clinical hypothyroidism. In clinical hypothyroidism, remember the free thyroid hormones would reduce and then the TSH would go high. And the next clinical entity to be summarized is a clinical hyperthyroidism. You have hyperthyroidism. So what do you expect? The free T3 and T4 levels would go up. And then the feedback mechanism, the TSH would go down. Then we have clinical, sorry, subclinical hypothyroidism. Subclinical hypothyroidism. And so there you would realize that the free T3, T4 will, will be normal. And then we have the TSH will be high. Then in subclinical hyperthyroidism, you would have a normal free thyroid hormones and then a reduced TSH. And then in central hypothyroidism, you would have a reduced free thyroid hormones and then a reduced TSH. Although I didn't create a space for the TSH secreting tumor, remember that we have an increased free T3, T4 and an increased TSH. And so friends, thank you for watching this episode of Tutor Med. Please do not forget to like and share this video. And more importantly, please do not forget to subscribe and then hit the notification bell. Thank you once again for watching this video and then see you in our next video. Until then, adios. Bye.